our previous period, we looked at, generally speaking, tribal religions around the world, some of the characteristics of tribal religions. Now I want to zero in, looking particularly at the African experience. Um, first of all, is the phenomenon of life cycles, meaning that everyone is in a particular category within the life cycle. First of all, is the unborn, the child in the womb. That's when the life cycle begins. When the child is born, you often have several naming uh, ceremonies that go on uh, related to one or several names that a child will get. And each name must fit the uh, characteristics of the child. Sometimes it will take a little while until the child gets any name, until you learn to know really what is the characteristic of this child. But once it becomes clear what the characteristic is, then a naming ceremony. But maybe as the child grows older in some tribes, a decision will be made to give the child another name now because the child's characteristic seems to be changing. The name must fit the child's character and personality. And there's a ceremony having to do with that naming experience. And then, of course, uh, comes the time of puberty, when a guy or a gal uh, move from childhood now into adulthood. And in all the tribes of Africa, there are traditions and ceremonies and practices related to that transition from childhood now to adulthood. And in many tribes, not all, but in many tribes, circumcision is part of the rite of passage from childhood to adulthood, um, which is a very meaningful and important ceremony uh, uh, in which the young person is inculcated, is taught the values and the secrets and the uh, inner workings of the clan and uh, commissioned to carry his responsibility or her responsibility now as an adult member of the clan. And then at another level comes marriage. Uh, in, uh, across Africa, every woman needs to get married and every man needs to get married uh, because it is so very, very important to have children. It is through children that we are remembered and so the function of marriage is preeminently the function of childbirth. And everyone is expected to participate in that commitment to tribal harmony and well-being and development and, uh, and every, uh, every aspect of tribal society is, uh, is informed by that commitment to having children. And uh, then um, comes the uh, time of maturity where you're carrying your responsibilities as a man or a woman. And as you get older then, the men, they are inducted into the clan of elders. But there's only one such, there's, there's several such inductions into the clan of elders. At about 45 or 50 years of age probably, the first induction, and then as you mature and you demonstrate wisdom and insight, you're inducted into the next level of eldership and finally to another level. And then eventually you come to the point of, uh, of death. Uh, where you uh, now transition into the next life, uh, which is thought of as being the realm of the living dead. You've not died, but you've simply made a transition now to the next realm of living, the living dead. Uh, so you carry on with your ancestral responsibilities now upon death. And so everyone is somewhere on that continuum of moving upward through the hierarchy uh, step by step by step by step until finally arriving at the status of the living dead. In some tribes, the living dead will return again, be reborn. And so instead of just hovering around the ancestral uh, home for decade after decade, in some tribes, the person returns into the womb of, of, uh, of, a, of a mother and the whole cycle begins again. In some tribes, that's that, that cyclic, cyclic, uh, cyclic, cyclical phenomenon uh, takes place. 
which is quite analogous to the Hindu idea that the soul gets reborn and then reappears in another form. In some African cultures, that's the way it is, but not all, not all cultures. Another characteristic which permeates uh, these societies is prayer. Um, and when, uh, a, when people become Christian in the African experience, this commitment to prayer transitions into the church. And uh, uh, I, I, I know that, um, for example, when you, sit, when you are welcomed into a home, in a, to a Christian home, uh, most likely as you step into the threshold, into the home, the host will say, now let's just pause for a moment and have prayer before you sit down. And so we all stand together and we have prayer together. And then uh, we sit down and next uh, comes now the time for the meal. And so we will have prayer uh, over the meal. Always the cook will lead in the prayer for the meal. And uh, then the time has come now to leave. And so they will have a prayer as we think of, uh, of departing now. And then you go out into the courtyard and you're ready to go on your journey. And as you get into your vehicle, there will be another prayer yet, you see. And so the whole process of being welcomed into a home and then eating and then being sent on your way is permeated with prayer. Now, in the pre-Christian atmosphere, pre-Christian uh, culture, prayer also permeated the life experience. But it was prayers uttered to the ancestral spirits, most likely, and rarely to God, because God in most cultures was thought to have gone on a, on a journey and he's not around anymore. And so you pray to the ancestors. But prayer permeating the culture. And then there are the taboos, um, which are uh, uh, practices related to what is right and what is wrong, what is acceptable and not acceptable. Uh, we talked about that a bit ago in regards to Okuru and Yakitumo and how when they wanted to get married, they were not permitted to marry because of a taboo against the bas basket maker clan and the blacksmith clan intermarrying. That was not permittable. There was a taboo against that. And so the cultures are permeated with taboo systems, things that are acceptable and things which are not acceptable. Many of the taboos have to do with incest concerns, um, proprieties between parents and daughter or parents and son and that kind of thing. Uh, parent uh, proprieties concerning in-laws and whatnot. All sorts of taboos regulating how one relates to one another uh, are part of these cultures. And then there are these sacred places or persons who need to be respected as sacred. Uh, sometimes the presence, the coming of the church into a community experiences special challenges in how to relate to that phenomenon of sacred places where the gods are thought to live or the ancestral spirits are thought to live in these sacred groves or whatever. That happened to my father uh, when they arrived among the Zanaki people. There was one other Zanaki Christian in the whole world, as far as we know, his name was Jonah. And he accompanied my parents as they set up their housekeeping and so forth among the Zanaki people. And Jonah needed to build a house, as was true of my father and mother as well. And so he went down to the valley. He'd been away for some years and was now returning home as a Christian. He went into the valley below our homestead there to cut down some trees that he needed for a house that he was building. And some women came out of a nearby village and they said, that grove is where the gods live. The ancestral spirits live there and the divinities, the nature gods live in that grove. And so if you cut any of those trees down, you will be cursed and you will die. You can't take those trees. So what do you do? Um, if you cut down the trees, then you are confronting the religious system and the cultural system front, you know, head on. And uh, one doesn't want to do that as you are moving into a community and learning to know them and so forth. But, uh, but not to cut down the grove would seem to say that they were concerned and uh, afraid of these divinities, that they respected these divinities. And the Christian witness is that Christ has triumphed over the divinities, that they are rendered powerless to what happened in the cross and resurrection. So what do you do? What do you do about that? And Jonah walked up the hill and he said to my father, 
you know, we have to cut down some trees. Uh, don't like to do it, but uh, what else? Because if we don't, the whole tribe will say that we're afraid of, we're afraid of these divinities. And uh, so they consulted and prayed and decided they would go down the hill and cut down the number of trees needed. Um, and uh, that same story, that same sort of dilemma, uh, if you study church history, has confronted the church over and over again. In Germany, the oak tree was considered God and divine. And as the church began its witness in Germany many years ago, in its polytheistic days, um, the decision was made by the church leadership to cut down the oak tree there at the heart of Germany, which was the center of German worship of trees. And they cut down this oak tree as a confrontation against these divinities that the Germans believed lived in these trees, or the tree itself was divinity. And that's what happened with my father and Jonah. They went down, the, down, down into the valley and they cut down the number of trees that they needed. They did not cut down more than they needed, but the trees needed for the house. And uh, subsequently, the tribal elders called on the witches, we talked about them today, called upon the witches and the shamans and so forth to curse Jonah and my parents. And in fact, they even dug a grave for them, we are told. Uh, whether that is true or not, I don't know, but that's what we're informed happened. And uh, the battle was cast, you know, between this newly arriving Christian community and, uh, <clears throat> and the traditional culture with its uh, strong, strong respect for sacred places and people. The grave stayed empty, and that was a powerful statement to the whole tribe that Christ has triumphed over the nature gods. Um, but it's not the kind of conflict that one welcomes at all. But I share that because it illustrates, I think, the questions and the issues that are oftentimes present as Christian faith, or sometimes as Islam, uh, meets um, uh, these traditional religions. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. Death rites, another area which uh, is very significant. Um, that it's in the death rites that there's ultimate question of, uh, of the meaning of life and the meaning of death and forgiveness, all of that, those three ultimate questions all converge powerfully and mightily around uh, the death experience. Um, and each tribe and each culture had their rights that you practice in terms of death, dealing with these ultimate questions. And the Christian church has its, its response to these questions as it relates to death and so forth. In Tanzania, uh, the first bishop of the churches that, I was re that I was, we were related to, uh, the first bishop was called Zedekiah Kisari. And um, uh, when his wife died of old age, why the tribal elders were determined that she'll, she will be buried in the tribal way, honoring the ancestors. And part of the tribal death rites included the need to send cows over the grave. The idea was that the spirit of the deceased is hovering around the homestead. And so you drive cows over the place where the person has been buried so that the, so that the ancestral spirit will follow the cows, because Luo liked cows very, very much, into the bush and leave the homestead at peace. If you don't chase cows over the grave, then the ancestral spirit will hover around the homestead God knows how long, you know, and might become a rather bothersome presence, to be sure. And so the whole tribe determined that this woman, this mother, bishop, you know, this wife of the bishop, shall be buried in the way of the traditional culture. And the bishop said, but listen to me, she is a Christian. We will not bury in the traditional way. She is the mother of the church. And so we need to bury her in a Christian manner. And that means we don't have to, we will not have cows going over the grave. 
And so what they did, what the traditional culture did, now this is 50 years after the church had taken root in that community, but it shows how intense the, uh, the issues were. Um, what, they, uh, what they did was to send drum beaters to the house of the bishop. And all night long, they beat these drums, boom, 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 trying to wear him down just to exhaustion. Um, so he would finally acquiesce and say, well, okay, go do it your way. But he stood very firm. My brother Joseph was there at the time, and the bishop said, really, you from, what, from North America need to leave. This is a matter which we Africans must resolve, and you don't understand the dynamics. Uh, although you have lived among us and been born among us, it's really best if you leave and you go to your guest house and pray for us. But for you to be involved uh, will confuse the situation considerably. For they may begin to think that this is a Western church, African church tension. And it's not. This has to do with the essence of the gospel and with, uh, with uh, how we deal with these traditional approaches to ancestral spirits. That's really what it's about. And we need to resolve that in our own way. So thanks for being here, but go to the guest house and rest and pray. Well, what they did was when the burial took place and the church, as you could imagine, the mother of the church was packed out with, I suppose, 2,000 people, 1,000 people certainly. When the burial happened, they piled the grave high with rocks so that no cattle could possibly go across that grave. And then later on, when there was more time, they built a very large concrete memorial right on top of the grave. Again, too high the concrete memorial for any cattle to go over it. And so that was a way in which the bishop tried to give witness to the culture that he is not beholden to the ancestral spirits uh, who the traditional culture venerated so very, very highly. These are some of the sorts of issues that one experiences as church meets traditional religion in the African context or in any context for that matter.